do the intro this time, but do it with the do it with the Doppler effect, okay? Do the Oh do, god. Do, okay. So so pretend I'm in well, one spot and do your let, intro. Let me let me let me do let an me, intro like the Doppler effect. Space. Can you can you line the switch to the turntable for me there, friend, while I do that? You're gonna go on the turntable? There's a there's well, another I engine spin on around. The Oh I well we can get the mono zoom out of the way, it's fine. You're just gonna yeet the mono zoom yeah, off. Yeah, well, duh. Oh my god. What's up, me... guys? This is Ison. I'm coming to the railroad so that Picard's not gonna land the switch. Uh, oh, I mean, I can just nail Betsy instead. Thanks, Con. Oh, Thanks, you know, Con. Dunk. Betsy won the fight. <laughs> Betsy won. <laughs> what what, what Betsy even wins. is this game? Let's go. Go, it's Betsy. Fine. It's fine. It's uh, it's it's fine. Don't even worry about it. Betsy's a champ. All right, so today we're gonna we're gonna nice nice intro heist. That was good. That was good. It was uh, it was real good. And I forgot how Doppler effect works. And I was like, confused uh, as to why you still didn't line the switch for me. Well, That's I why. didn't want you to kill Montezuma, and I knew Betsy was just gonna win that fight. So. <laughs> anyway, let's put I see Betsy how it is. Way back there. Uh, I'm using the uh, the 050 uh, turntable right now. That's fine. What, what? The hand, and the, oh, hand the hand of God came down from heaven. Oh, and, I see. Uh, yes, and then the engine was facing the other way. Right. So, so uh, today we're going to uh, we're going to go do some stuff. I'm going to connect up to the ironworks really quick, which won't take us very long, seeing as how the hump yard is already halfway there, and uh, it really doesn't take much, you know, extra difficulty. It's literally a straight flat piece of track I'm going to run. So we're going to connect to the ironworks, and then Heist is going to go down to the smelter. And grab some raw iron. You should be fine. I mean, last episode we were fine with, you know, hauling up rails. And I feel like that's heavier, right? Right. So you should be... Yeah, I should be fine. Worst case, I can grab a helper engine or, or yeah. beg for help. Um, It'll be fine. But, you know, since uh, since I don't I don't know what uh, you've got on your agenda of topics, Heist. Do you have your <laughs> topics for today's podcast? You... Oh, oh, goodness. Did I need to come up with topics? I don't know. Was what there homework? To? Did you come up with any? I did you? I, I, I did not come up with any topics oh, okay. like right, right away. No. Um, I didn't realize there's homework. I had a comment, actually. I'm going to go look at the comment. I'm going to go find it real quick. Let me go look at the comments because I remember I had a comment on the last video and I someone said, like, people leave me comments to, like, ask Heist things and I do that um <laughs> hold on uh let me see okay so someone says we should buy a shay and name it shumpty dumpty for running the hump and all it no. does is all it does is, no. is hump <laughs> as a shay it's a shay humper i mean uh, i mean you'd be yeah. better off having the betsy run the hump probably i'm just i'm just shay, saying that's what they say fine. uh hold on i had i knew there was a question here i just i can't uh, someone said we should run the Shay for a switchback line, and you should ask Heist why switchbacks are the best chunk of railroad ever designed. Switchbacks are not the best chunk of railroad. I mean, like, you ha if you use them if you have to, but you want to talk about killing your efficiency right away. I mean, okay, let's stop the train and then start it again. And stop and, st like, we talked about last time we were talking about horsepower and steam locomotives and everything, and it's like, Steam engines are not great at starting trains, so you're going to make us stop and start this thing and make people need to mess with their water level so that they can make sure the water level's fine going both directions. And switchbacks are really just like a total pain. Um, if you could avoid them, you would, which is why we've done 10% ridiculous shenanigans. Instead and if of you have a switchback, you do, they do like, usually it's just one engine on one side. Sometimes you can do both, I guess, depending on how you want to. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different operational practices with switchbacks throughout history in different places. Um, sometimes it was as simple as engine runs up the hill, and okay, you run into the dead end siding, and then it shoves back. Sometimes they had dedicated engines per lane of the shunt pack, like or of the switchback. Look at me, you got me saying all these silly railroad terms you've come up with, Con. What switchback uh, shunting? You mean sh shunting lanes and things? Yes. <laughs> Hey man, I so, just I talk about railroads as if I was an eight year old. Okay, like that's that's where my railroad vocabulary was born, and that's where it it's still at. So well, that's fine. It works. <laughs> but so, sometimes they would have dedicated locomotives to hand things off to try and make the water problem a little less frustrating and challenging. Um, and sometimes they had really weird setups. Like there was uh, I can't remember which railroad it was. I think it was. I can't remember. There is a turntable that was used as the switchback, and they would run the whole train across the turntable at the switchback location for another locomotive to then hop on and, and pull it, if I'm remembering right. Someone will know the history based on Wait, this. Wait, so they had a turntable, and they yeah. would 
they would like drive the whole train over the turntable, which is terrible. Yes. And then and then what? Flip the engine around and then push the train the other way, or a different engine would be off like one of the sh uh, off like I a care, line. I can't honestly the... remember which one it is. Uh, it would probably. I mean, it could be either with uh, how silly it was, but it was one of those places where it was remote mountain Colorado, uh, <laughs> and they had to build like a hut over the turntable. So it was like a like a turntable and what looked like a little castle kind of because they couldn't deal with the snow filling up in the turntable pit. All right, so uh, here's the other comment. Someone said, um, do you know of the narrow gauge mining town in Santa Cruz known as Roaring Camp? I do. Apparently uh, it burned down in 1940 is what I've heard. Roaring Camp. So I don't know about the town, but the Roaring Camp Railroad, the Roaring Camp and Big Trees, uh, I always, I thought that was always a tourist railroad. But it is a narrow gauge three foot line that's got a lot of the prototypes from the game are actually from there. Uh, the original Heisler, before they remodeled it to be older, uh, was kind of as the current Heisler that runs there exists and stuff. And um, it's a really neat railroad, and it's got some really crazy grades and, cur like, 9% grade on the main and stuff. It's like, okay, you're actually doing this? It's a little ridiculous. Um, quick question. I'm building the ironworks as a sort of end-of-line industry, right? Where sure. Where the main line goes straight at it, and then it'll fork right before the industry into, like, the... I guess receiving and uh, output, like input output sides of the industry, because it's input on one side, output on the other. Um, but if I'm doing that, I wouldn't have like a runaround track. Like, how would I, you know what I mean? Like, how do I, do I have to have a big runaround track in front of the industry, or does it, would they be? Oh, you be... gotta have, you gotta have some way to run around the train, whether it makes sense to do it at the industry somehow or, or as on the main line. So, like, I need uh, multiple lanes on industry. both sides, basically. It would be the, Pretty much, yeah. I, either that, or you have them come to a throat where the runaround is, um, and then split when they've already there. collected and then split. Yeah. Are there actual like? I guess that. I mean, there's always actual everything, but I'm assuming there's end of line industries. Like, there's industries that end on, especially up in the mountains, or just be like, I guess it wouldn't oh, even for be. Sure. Yeah. Wouldn't even be like a main line. It would be like this is the line to get to. This place is the X. branch line for this industry, and the the railroad ends here. Yeah. That's yeah. Definitely a thing. Sometimes it would be as simple as just a run around and the, and the loading track and running around it. Sometimes there'd be a little bit of a yard. Sometimes there'd be more facilities like a Y and, and turntable and, and all sorts of stuff like that. It just depends on the, the amount of cars coming in and out and the territory the railroad needed to run to to get there. Right. So I'm trying out something that a viewer suggested after they watched me pee in a cup so many times with the Glenbrook. Okay, what's that? Um, and this is this is very intrinsically frustrating for me with how steam locomotives work, but you can limit your speed by setting the reverser position to like twenty or thirty percent instead of a hundred. Instead of a hundred and leaving the reg at a hundred percent, and that's limited the speed. But according the, uh, to real life, flat that would, you'd still eventually build up to max speed doing that, or uh, like you're you're actually more likely to go faster with less reverser settings like that's what you do you hook up the bar to go faster and here it is doing the opposite which is uh, I, I still i don't days. i still don't understand <laughs> that logistically like you have the johnson bar controls the valve positions the valve positions are based yep. on the wheel movement the wheel rotation yep right and like no matter how much throttle you put in if your valve position is not lined up you're not going to go but i don't understand how less reverser that means less valve movement which somehow makes you go faster i don't understand how that so so it's not so much about making you go faster as much as it is stopping you from trying to stop yourself because when you have the johnson bar further forward or further out of center you have more lead built into the valve because the valve's traveling more and lead is how much advance or ahead of its ideal position quote unquote the valve actually moves right and so you need to have that lead when you're at bigger position settings of the bar because you need to make sure you can cushion the piston when you're putting a lot of force on it before it gets to the other end because you don't want to you know, you have to start slowing the piston down before you can apply power going the other way. If you right. tried to instantaneously do it, you'd break stuff. And so what you find is when you start getting up to higher speeds and that cutoff is rapidly changing, uh, you actually end up working against yourself rather than trying to get the power stroke because it's assuming that it's going to take the piston a decent amount of time to reverse and then get the power underneath it with that lap or the, the lead in the valve. And so... Uh, 
that is just designed so that, okay, when you limit the travel, you're no longer cushioning yourself to slow down to apply power in the other direction as quickly, which means you have less effective, like, braking force, which isn't there when you're running slow, and that's why you can have the bar super far forward. Just because it takes so slow. long for the valve to move anyway, it's like... Yes, by exactly. The time it, yeah, okay. And so when, when you start going fast, you pretty much have to bring the bar up, otherwise you're going to be fighting yourself. Uh, and you can feel it, actually. Like, you can feel if you have the... If you kick the bar too far forward, the engine doesn't like it, usually, <laughs> depending on what the speed is. So it's actually a really important thing. It's not like it mechanically makes it, okay, the locomotive is now capable of going faster. You're right. just no longer fighting yourself at a, as hard, given that boundary condition. But theoretic So theoretically, though, the fastest speed of a locomotive is going to be throttle bar full out, Johnson bar at some position that's not full, but still forward. Yeah, still forward and as forward, as high up to center as it possibly can be. And then, of course, I mean, like, load and everything plays into that too, right? But, right. Um, and that also depends on the kind of valve gear you have because different valve gears behave differently throughout their travel. And this is something that I need to get to in a serious 101 class at some point. Um, but the engines in game, most of them have what's called Stevenson's valve gear where there's eccentrics and everything in the middle uh, based off the axles on the inside that actually set the motion of the valve. And Stevenson is really interesting in that it can have variable lap and lead throughout the travel of the valve gear. So you can set it so that the engine will run, I mean, ideally, on center, it will continue to move forward and even one notch in the opposite direction because of the lead that the valve has. And I've actually tested this myself with our GS20, Stevenson valve gear. But that's, but that's not, your fastest, so your fastest position theoretically is always like, at neutral then for or is it pretty really? much yeah but with valve gears like walshirt's valve gear or baker valve gear they don't actually let the valve travel far enough to uncover the ports necessarily on center so you may not be able to have any steam admitted so it may be two notches out of center or three notches out of center depending on how worn out the engine is love it yeah that's neat stuff it's one of those things like it's really weird to perceive when you when you run 491 she's got wall shirts valve gear and she needs some work in some of the uh, the bushings and some of the pins and the valve gear because each connection in there as it wears contributes to loss of motion or or changes things right and she still sounds pretty good she's relatively in time uh if you have her in the corner if you have the bar all the way forward she actually sounds pretty bad but uh, it's just one of those things, and we're planning on getting to it uh, when it, you know, when it matters, and when we get a big rebuild on 491. It's just kind of the way they work, like wear in, and then that's what the engine does for a little bit. Um, but there is a notch in the Johnson bar where you pull it past that notch, and it she falls on her face. She's not emitting any steam to the piston anymore, and it sucks with her because she's got the superheater units and everything. So you go for one more click back, and then she takes off like a rocket. So uh, I've almost put our conductor on his butt several times trying to hook it up one more and going too far until I learned the bar really well. And okay, you can't go so what you, any what you're further saying than this. Is, what you're saying is putting the reverser or the throttle at 100% and having the gear motor slip infinitely is not that far off from your wall shirts. I mean, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> you go one notch too far. She's got no power. Then you go back, and she's she's giving her like you know it's right. So it's yeah. more realistic. See, than you let on. See, that's what that's what I'm getting at. That's, I understand. Well, that's uh, that's fine. But okay, so if that all those like all those mechanisms, they're all like they're all steel rods and bushings and bearings and all that sort of thing, right? To like make them move and all that. And I'm assuming it's a lot of like like pivot points that are literally just a rod with like a bushing on it and another rod coming off it. But like. Do they, can they ever, I know like all that stuff's going to wear out. Can they ever wear to the point where it's literally just an ineffective throttle or is it like it's got oh, too yeah. much? It's oh, too... oh yeah. You hear an engine that's really worn out. It'll start sounding pretty out of time where the valve events are no longer. And the valve can poor, like go where right? it wants to go rather than going where you're telling it to go type thing. Or yes. Just... The steam can kind of push the valve where it wants it to go rather than where it's being constrained to go. Cause you've lost that constraint by wearing out the bushings or the pins or whatever it is. Uh, and you and just so feel you'll hear, that. like you just, you can just tell. You'll hear it. The the engine won't go chuff, 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 chuff. It'll kind of go chuff, 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 chuff. You know, 
that oh, they won't line up anymore. It's always a bad time. And hearing engines that are out of time is kind of annoying. And, and it actually makes a big difference. Like people are like, oh, it's fine. That, you know, it'll run out of time and that's okay. Well, yes, but think about what it does with fatigue stress. You're no I mean, longer your car evenly will, your stressing Your car it. will run out of time too, but that's not like, you know, if your camshaft is unevenly worn and it runs out of, like, sure, it'll run, but it'll blow up soon too. Like, it's not... Right. So steam engines, because they're so low RPM, they can get away with it for a long time. Right. But if you think about it, it, I don't know if you learned fatigue stress and that sort of fun stuff. Oh no, in your I, 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 I hated that in engineering. It was the worst. It's 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 not the most simple thing to understand. It's but very the, dry material is what it is. It is. But if, if you boil it down to the, the important piece for the point I'm making, if you evenly stress something, so I push on a rod and I bend it one way to 50 pounds, okay, or 50 PSI, whatever it is, and then you bend it exactly the opposite way to 50 pounds again you have even fatigue stress so that you're trying to bend the thing back and forth and like you bend a paper clip and eventually it fails because you've bent it back and forth too much yeah you do you get the same effect you get the same thing but it's compounded significantly if you don't have the force be even so if you do 50 psi one way and you do 30 the other way you're going to break that component a lot faster because yeah, the makes fatigue sense. stress is uneven and so if you have uneven exhaust beats you're giving uneven power which means you're getting uneven stress in all of the components on the locomotive as far as the running gear goes and so oh it's fine it'll run like that well i mean yes it will run like that but you're going to destroy the locomotive you know based on a fatigue stress reason pretty quick how uh have you ever seen a locomotive fail that way you ever seen a um, I've never seen a really spectacular failure of a locomotive in person. Ever? Um, like, for anything? It's never been... I've never seen it. The, the, I was there one day when we had a piece of the suspension break. And, um, that must have that sounded was a, fun. That was, uh, <laughs> the funny thing is the sound wasn't that bad, uh, apparently. I wasn't on the engine. I was over in the shop getting ready for, I don't know, something else. And we're getting ready for ops that night, so I had something else to do. But uh, <laughs> the guy who was running it, he said it just went... Dink. like high pitched like oh yeah something sheared off and then the engine sat different and it's like oh that's not good <laughs> so we limped it back to the shop and cut out a piece and fabbed it together and threw it together pretty quick i think we did have to delay some of the ops for it but it, uh, that's a tense moment <laughs> my solace right now is that these cars only take three a piece oh that, so yeah that's that's at what least I... they do load kind of quick yeah, the raw iron's a pretty quick one, which is kind of nice. Not excited for the box cars. I mean, box cars are cool. I'm excited for us to have a box car and have it be in a train. Yeah, it's I'm like you only need one though. It. it loads like 64 tools and it loads them one at a time. It's fine. And, yeah, and like how many? I don't even know. I'm I'm right here right now. I should check how many tools can we actually even make at this at this I place total. I think we can have maybe a hundred, and I 100. think the car takes 32, so you can really only load like three, three cars. Three of them. But unless you then, have, no, like, that's not true. If you have the inputs of the industry full, then okay, we could. So you could have more than that, yeah. Yeah, you could load up more that way. But it's like, for the amount of tools that the oil field and everything uses afterwards, you really yeah, I don't agree. need it's kind that of... much. The ratio doesn't make sense. No, the the tools I think should just be a little bigger and less, like maybe ten per box car or something, or even eight. And then just make it like a bigger tool chest, you know? And then that way it would... Yeah, there's there's no reason that they need to be these little crates. And there's yeah. also no reason really, that you need to click on know, the crane that many times. But I always loved when I was a kid having trains that were... Which I understand this is very unrealistic, but trains that were just made up of all boxcars, you know? Like big... big oh, that's not unrealistic. That's a thing that happens. No, I mean in the narrow <laughs> gauge days, you wouldn't have all box... Uh, no, nope, be... that, that was still a thing that happened. Yeah. Yeah, but I thought their narrow gauge was more like infamous for the raw material loaders of the century, you know, like the... Yeah, the... well, yes, yes and no. I mean, you think about the Denver and Rio Grande in its early days and what it did. I mean, it was the railroad that was in Colorado, really. Yeah, other railroads started up really quickly around them, the DSP and P and everybody else. Um, but at, at the end of the day, your general traffic between towns was being shipped on those railroads. So it's not like... Oh yeah, it's just the mines and just this, which, you know, that's definitely a big piece of it, but a lot of generalized traffic went across the railroad like that. 
How dare you think that we didn't have boxcar trains? Well, you know, you I should don't... see. You should see like one of the most infamous things in the narrow gauge that ended up being like big unit trains was unit trains of livestock, cows and sheep and whatever. Right. They would have these the stock rush when they weren't even moving them to market. They weren't taking the cars to Denver, but they were just moving dudes' herds to different grazing grounds because they had so many head of cattle and sheep and everything that they would graze everything they could in one area and the seasons would change and then they would need to take them somewhere else. And so they would put together like an 80 car narrow gauge stock train and load these car, you know, tons and tons of cars with all these animals and drive them to the next place. All right, let me, uh, so this is this side done. That's excellent. So let me go look through the comments again. All for, right. For more exciting things. Well, welcome to the Q&A episode. Q&A episode. Okay, so a lot of people, blah, 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 nothing. See, people are just saying, this is cool, this is cool, but, uh, you know, I had a whole, uh, I had a whole thing. Someone commented that apparently in Austria, and I don't know how true this is, but their comment says that apparently in Austria, their train schedules are set to be, like, if the train was going slower than the speed limit, so that they can actually make up time when they need to. Well, that's relatively accurate. You you try and uh, make sure that you can keep to the schedule that you have, so that if you have any changes or you have any anything come up, uh, you don't run into problems making schedule. Because the the best train is a train that runs on time, not a train that's ahead of schedule. You want to be able to plan this sort of stuff. So that is pretty common in uh, train design overall. Yeah. I don't know how much you can talk about it, but we've never really talked about it. You said you used to work for, like, what, the BNSF, the, which is up in Seattle? It's like a railroad? Yep. Well, BNSF, I mean, they're they're more than just up in Seattle. What does BNSF yes. actually stand for? It's like... Burlington something. Northern Santa Fe. Okay. And I am failing at doing this Dutch job right now. Things are about to Kenosha. I can smell it. Oh, that's good. That's oh, yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. I did this to myself. Okay, perfect. So anyway, so it's... Okay, so it's... it's um. <laughs> It's a railroad up in... I don't know how steep that is. That seems really steep. So it's a railroad up in, in the west side of the U.S., basically, the western yeah, west coast Yeah, so US. pretty much everywhere west of the... I can't remember if it's the Mississippi or the Missouri River off the top of my head. Um, but, like, the western two-thirds of the United States. They have 32,000 route miles. Um, I think it's the second biggest. Someone corrected me last time. I guess UP's got more... Uh, more railroad than BNSF does, but it's uh, one of the two big railroads on the west side. Right. We have five class ones in the states um, that are not Canadian. We do also have the two Canadian ones also operate in there, but um, of the five, there's only two that run in the west, and that's UP and BNSF, so not okay. too much competition. And more specifically, what the heck did you actually do there? I was a mechanical foreman one by title, which is a fancy way to say shop supervisor. So I was in charge of uh, staffing, scheduling, planning, uh, everything, listening to complaints, blah, 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 dealing with idiots being idiots at the locomotive repair shop. And uh, that's all that's all maintenance related. Like that was all maintenance and repairs. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we had some aspects that were basically like train jiffy lube where right. locomotives would come in for their 92 day or 184 day or 368 day servicing. And they're, but they're um, all locomotives owned by BNSF or whatever. They're not... Mostly, yes. There were weird exceptions sometimes, but, you know, it was for our railroad. Uh, so sometimes, like, we did some contract maintenance for Amtrak when their wheel machine died. Uh, we worked on some Amtrak engines. Uh, we would work on leased locomotives if they would come in. Uh, so, you know, there would be a, an engine that was on horsepower hours from another railroad or another holding company or whatever. Um, and so then we would, you know, deal with the maintenance on them as they came up per the AAR standards, which is the Association of American Railroads. Right. Um, and, you know, so we'd have that. But primarily, yeah, it was maintaining and fixing and upgrading uh, the BNSF fleet. It was pretty cool. Um, other than the scheduling and being management, uh, I loved it. <sighs> other Getting than being be management. Being management. Yeah, because, I mean, you're the first level of... Manager, yeah, no, I get it. You're you're the right. you're the first manager too, which is the worst manager. Yeah. You want to be like yeah, the manager so... of the managers. That's the good the good manager to be in in engineering. If you're if you're yes. the first manager, you take all the crap from the employees and from the management above you. So you're really the yes. worst 
the worst a thousand level million percent yeah. yeah so like no i get the, it the, the problem i ended up running into a lot of the times was i wanted to side with the guys well, of course like, you do because I... the employees the employees generally know better than the managers the managers when it comes yes, to yes and, how to and run the, the policies of the company and everything too so like they would yeah. roll out a new policy or something and i personally wouldn't agree with it but i had to uphold it and it's like this is screwing with my guys and i know this is screwing with my guys and i know what they go through and i know what they have to deal with and it feels hard to like you feel like you're being pulled in a taffy machine it sucked so that and then the schedule i mean they could never find a supervisor schedule that made any sense for us I, it was just it was just the worst sounds so. about right i ended up doing um the the schedule we ended up with the most was 12 hour shifts four days on three days off three days on four days off so you s kept the same days off except for one you would flip-flop so i would work sunday monday tuesday and every other wednesday but from 5 p.m to 5 a.m and it was oh your management so you're expected to show up early and my game crashed that's cool. um are you moving um oh yeah yeah i mean the engine's ro moving with the reg off theoretically at the smelter Oh, it should be fine then. Should but stop. yeah, you need to you need to save and rehost because I I derailed a car that I loaded, and then I re-railed it. So well, that's, that's perfect. No, no, that's, that's perfect. A, that's well, good news is I'm actually like just about done this shunt yard, like completely. So I'm just gonna connect these last three pieces of track, and then I'll meet you down at the smelter and ride back. All right, Heist, how's it going? How you doing? Uh, doing doing pretty good. I'm staring at my choo choo. Um, you, sir, little, I'd like uh, to see your I'd like to ski your uh, your tonnage slip. Sir, I'd like to know that your tonnage... I don't know. How do they actually do uh, Is it a slip? Is it, is it a piece of paper? I mean, you have like a manifest with what cars and what cars you're supposed to have and how much they weigh. How many cars of toxic phenol do you have? Okay, is the um, question. And All of them, and they're and, all really dangerous. And you're going to yeah. put them in notch eight. Is it molten phenol, though? It better be molten uh, phenol. I, I'm pretty sure it's molten phenol. Uh, and you're going you're to throw in notch eight then? And just, just... Yep. Yeah, look at I'm all this gonna molten phenol we've got going on here. We're also bringing was, a tree. 39 cars and a tree. And a tree. Oh, <laughs> tree's gone. Okay, just 39 <laughs> cars. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Great. This is awesome. So I'm uncrashed. We're back moving. Yeah, that's uh, true. We are moving. We're going towards the wonderful ironworks. Um, it's interesting because our freight depot isn't actually a loop anymore, which is like, I've never done that before. So now our freight depot, we just drive right on past the freight depot is like a normal mainline thing. Just blow right through it. Yeah. yeah. Just That'll like another station on the route. That bridge Act bothers me. Do you see that bridge piece that's like not connected there? Like every time we drive by oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's a little, a little sad. That's I'm just fine. gonna do some maintenance while we're dying. Sounds no. good. Just dropping trees on the train. Yeah, hopefully not on the train, but if it happens, it happens. You know, it's, uh, it's what happens. Spice, uh, I was going to call you spicy. Uh, um, <laughs> so spicy, this ice, is ice. Ice, 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 we're getting spicy. Indeed. Do you hear those chuffs? They're chuffing I do. pretty. I want to hit the hill with some speed because we're going to slow down pretty significantly, I think, with 12 cars. The last time we ran, we had eight. No, so we I did don't 12, know. didn't we? Didn't we do 12 cars already? I'm sure we did 8. Was it 8? Yeah, I don't think it was 12 cars, because we didn't have 12 cars already. Oh, we only so. did... So we only... Oh, there goes that tree. See ya. <laughs> Later! No, we only did 12 cars. That's right, we did 12 cars to the iron mine. But we yeah, only did 8. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what it'll do with 12. So but raw iron's good, lighter. But... Raw iron's like only 9,800 pounds. Rails are like 19,000 pounds. We're like half the weight. Okay, well, I guess it should work, but I just want to make sure I hit it with a little speed, make sure we make it happen. So. Are you at full reg right now? Yep, full, full. Yeah, that seems doesn't... like it's slowing down a little bit, but it seems that, like it's yeah, doing it. Yeah, doesn't sound so. great, does it? We should make it, because you got the little flat section after the, the curvy bridge up there. True. Real brief, and we'll be able to accelerate a little bit there, and we should, I think. The worst case, I'll worst get case, out and push, uh, you know, and it all... Oh, yeah, that helps. I'll, I'll, I have at least another... 2,000 pounds of tractive effort, I think. Okay, so at what would least, be the what would least. be the actual tractive effort of a person? It would be how much you can pull. Like that's that's literally. But like, couldn't yeah. you theoretically pull more on like a track with rails? Like, couldn't you pull a 400 pound rail cart by by yourself? Well, or so is that... so tractive effort is not like a measurement of exactly how much weight you can pull. 
subtractive right. effort relates to the resistance, rolling resistance that you can pull, right? So we can talk about like horsepower and tractive effort and all that stuff. The back of the napkin method that I like to use is called the Cole method because it's, it's pretty simplified and it makes for easy tonnage math and it doesn't get into super crazy hard science because technically what kind of bearings you have, what temperature it is, and all this stuff all changes it. But the Cole method simplifies things down to, okay, for this many pounds of train, this is how much rolling resistance you have for that many pounds of train, you know, dragging behind you on a straight track. Curves add this much, grades add this much. Good luck, have fun, figure it out. So uh, the tractive effort, I mean, it would probably be a couple hundred pounds for a human. Let's see what you could pull. So like, we were talking about this earlier. You said like one person or a couple people could push a modern day car on roller bearings, but yeah, there's no way you'd ever push a narrow gauge car by yourself. Like, um, if it was roller bearings, maybe, and you were decently strong. But if it was plain bearings, what about like not. a tender weight? Like just the weight of a tender? Is that even movable if it's empty? Um, mm, probably. How do you guys get your tenders still, hooked up to your not. engines? Oh god, that's a that's a process, Con. <laughs> They're like, I'm assuming that's... it's easier than it's not just one pin. There's like a whole series of connections. Well, like there's steel connections, yeah. there's hoses, and then there's yeah. So there's a lot, and it depends on the engine for exactly what the lot is. But it, it's an interesting challenge because when you have the tender sitting as it sits, the hoses dangle on the tender side. Uh, the drawbar, which goes between the engine and tender, sits down too because it right. has to be pinned into the engine to be at the right height. So you have to either wedge the draw bar up or we've actually taken to using a floor jack Wait, to push how, it up. How heavy is the draw bar that holds the tender? Um, I mean, 491s is probably six inches wide and two and a half or three inches tall and five or six feet long steel. So several hundred pounds. <laughs> I mean, they're they're pretty stout. Everything everything's like bigger with train. Everything just, train is just big just and scary. It's just it's just yeah. yeah that's that's insane. So I mean, you can try and lift it up and then like put white wedges under it. But the the end of the day, what happens is you have to compress the locomotive into the tender to get the pin in because at least some of our engines have a spring buffer that keeps the tender sprung away from so the engine. So you have to put the tender brakes on and then jam the locomotive in Well, the so you, we, don't, uh, we don't use the brakes because there's no way to keep the air happy, really, without plugging a bunch of stuff because the hoses, right? Um, so what we end up doing is we shove it up against a skate on the back of the track that's like a, an actual like, clamped to the track buffer kind of thing, but it just grabs the wheel. Uh, and then we use the diesel to shove the steam engine into the tender, but we have a floor jack holding the, the draw bar up to the right height. And you very, very careful with the diesel and people giving signals, making sure it's going into the pocket, adjusting as need be, going slow. And then you compress the engine into the tender, drop the draw bar pin in. Then there are safety chains, which are a replacement for the draw bar. So if you have a problem with the draw bar, you have two chains that run from the engine and tender that are super, and super heavy-duty chains. They're actually strong enough to hold the tender, like to keep it attached under... Oh, God, yeah. The links are made out of, like, inch, inch bar, inch okay. round bar, or maybe even bigger than inch. Uh, so, <laughs> definitely. Um, then you've got two water lines, one for each injector, and then, depending on the engine, you either have just the brake pipe and then the straight air for the independent uh, or you might also have signal air which 491 has because it's tender ran behind an engine that sometimes ran passenger trains uh, you might also have a drag flanger line which is another airline to control a drag flanger which is for clearing snow uh, and then the little engines like these ones in the game I'll, I'll actually Glenbrook's not like that but like a class 70 with the air tank on the tender you have the main reservoir send from the air pumps to the main reservoir, the air main, res main reservoir return back to all the appliances on the engine as two separate hoses as well. So you end and up- And then you have another hose off the stuff. back of the head tender that goes to like the cars and stuff. And that's your brake pipe, yeah. So right. you have brake pipe between the engine and tender as well, and then from the tender back. So the spring-loaded thing on the tender bar, that is so that when the tender's under compression with the engine, it doesn't just jam into the back of the locomotive. Is that the idea behind that? Like it's just... more It's more for limiting the, yeah, limiting the load transfer and the impulse of the load transfer if you take a big set on the independent or something. Right. Uh, but it's more for if you're backing up 
uh, that way the tender doesn't hunt really bad. Because right. I've ridden in an engine that didn't have one, and the tender, as you're backing up, tender leading, it just goes bang, bang, bang. Yeah, because it's gonna bang, back it's gonna into gonna the just engine. Smack all, all all the like the draw uh, all the um, all the looseness, I guess, in the drawbar connections are just it's just gonna be free playing. It just flops around because there's right. it's not like the train's pressing on it. It's free, you know. Yeah. So it's. Uh, so oh, okay, so you so. guys, you guys do it with a bunch of modern stuff. Use floor jacks and all this stuff, and use another local. How would you do it back in the day? Like, would you just use another locomotive to like, like, could you jam? Probably. I guess you just jam the track up back the local. Like, you could drive a locomotive without its tender, can't you? Like, it's you, you can. It's not ideal because you can't hook more water up and put more water in it because you don't have your water with you. Right. Um, but you certainly can, and I'm sure that that's happened where they. Put the engine together the under boilers its own power. just full of water, and they're just like, "All right, we have until this thing boils down to." <laughs> right, we have we need to get the tender hooked up, and you, you could hook up other things. Like if you're at the shop and doing this, like it wouldn't be so dire that you would, wouldn't be able to do it. So, um, wouldn't be the end of the world. But you, you definitely the old school way is getting oak wedges and wedging the drop bar up to the right height, and then right. putting it together. We use the floor jack just because it's easier. Uh, and you can be out of the way, and you can adjust it on the fly without needing to get in between. Um, so it saves us a little bit of time while we're putting it together, uh, and also keeps people out from in between equipment that's coming together. And you know, so that's a big deal. But so, otherwise, the process is pretty similar. Yeah. How often do you pop tenders off locomotives? Um, pretty much once a year. Uh, like right now, actually, all well, two of our engines have their tenders off 346 and 491 so that they can both sit in stall one together so we can get one of we only have five stalls in the round house uh third stall is like the machine shop and there's not really space to put anything in there otherwise anyways uh and with three engines Hold and up, with slow, their slow, tenders slow. We're, we're oh i see the main for once ah, brakes reverse it's eight cars of raw iron man got uh, it it's fine. Uh, okay yeah that's that worked that's okay. how that goes that's uh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Um, yeah. So three engines, w when their tenders are on, they take up three stalls, and then we only have one stall left over. And we try to do a lot of restoration work in the winter too. So we pop 346 and 491's tenders off. They both sit in stall one together, so we can keep them both inside and work on both of them. And then 20s and stall and, two. And you put really together. like you pop them off, and you don't really have to restore the tenders nearly as often as like I mean. It's, it's a tender. It's a tank on wheels. It's, it's a tank on really... wheels with a couple hose connections, and that's it. Like there's not really it, much else there, to it. There are things you need to do. You have to annual the tender like any other piece of rolling stock, like any other freight car, and check the bearings and check your center castings and make sure nothing's cracked and re-grease things and right. there's stuff to do and we'll do that and that's part of what we do on the annual right um but uh yeah it's pretty much once a year tenders get kicked off do the annual and the tender tender can live outside it's not the end of the world uh you know we're not worried about people messing with the tender them. near as much as the engine so you drain yes, we the drain tender them. once you take yeah. it off and then and then what how, well, do you get, how do you move your tenders around do you have a little shover like a little gas powered shoving thing or well so they got a coupler on the back still so we can use that to move them around so we try and stick them in a place that we can just grab them with our little diesel mechanic or gas mechanical switcher peewee which is a cute little eight ton uh four speed manual straight six gas engine that runs straight to the track it's basically a tractor on rails um and we can move them around with that or you can use the draw bar as like linking pin to a diesel. If you take the coupler out, you can actually just go into the coupler pocket with the drawbar, which don't is something love we recently how this learned is we like, could do. Not to interrupt, but don't you love how this is like a clear cut line of trees looking straight at the freaking. That is fun. It's like, welcome home, son. <laughs> there it is. The, the industry only now just popped into view for me. Yeah. So uh, it's a good look. It's a good vibe. Anyway, yeah, yeah. There's always a way to, to move stuff around. You can always like figure eight chain stuff around the drawbar and. And, and things like that too, if you need to, which I've been there, done that. So. But when you, you're moving tenders around, so you put the tender somewhere and then it has a hand wheel and you hand crank the brakes because there's no air. Uh, it does not. None of our tenders actually have hand brakes, actually. And so, so there's you no just air leave so them unbraked then, or do you chalk the wheels? On, we chalk the wheels or chain the wheels. And we do that on almost everything, anyways, um, unless there's some reason we can't. But like every piece of equipment what is has chaining wheels chalked wheels? or chained. It's like a wheel that you, it locks you use a wheel. chain as a chalk. If, and a chain can easily slip around both sides, whereas a chalk, you need like a dedicated chalk. I, that I don't, fits but like, both I don't sides. you're holding the wheel from rotating? Like it, it's got like yeah, a. Yeah, the, the flange bites into the chain and tries to. It's trying to jump over the chain. So you put so the chain the on the track, track as a. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, oh, we're in the wrong lane. We need You're, to back We're not back lined up. for the. Yeah, I see. I see what's going on here. This is a nice looking little yard you built. Yes, yeah, it's the same on both sides. It's just two little four lane bow yards, and then they go to an extra little bit of drill track at the end, so you can run around various trains, and that's pretty cool. much it. Hopefully, it's long seems, enough. The unload cool. lane is long enough for this thing, which I think it will be. I joined Should your company, be. by the way, because you're still the money holder for now. That's right. I'm the man, the money man. Yeah. And then there's a Y out there, which we'll have to go experiment with and see how it goes. I uh, <laughs> had to put a 10% on it, so we'll see how it works. But I think it'll be fine. So it's like, it's basically, it's a, the end of line industry, right? So you split there, you pick if you're going to the, you know, input or output side. This is the input side. The other side's the output side. we got our little telegraph office. And you unload your stuff, run around the train, flip around at the Y, back right in. And you're kind of fouling the main when you go to the Y, but not really, because, like, it's not really the main anymore. It's the industry, so... Well, that's kind of what you have to do sometimes. It, and yeah, it matters game, a little you know? less, but... Anyway, you could just roll on by it, and if you do it slow enough, I should be able to just unload here. Okay. We can we'll hold to up to 100 nice raw iron, speed. so... Should be a good well, we chunk should of have change. 12 times 3. We should have 36, so... Yeah, good chunk of change here. We need to get I'm the hoping. 280 cook at some point, too. I really I really want that as a road engine. I've heard, it, I've heard that's a speedy boy. Yeah, before we and get the class. And the Mosca, class. and... Yeah, there's lots of good choo choos for us to get still. Yeah, true. Actually, the Moscow's another good one. All right, this is this is this is working out well. Good speed. Yeah, it looks like it. It looks like I can actually run a smidge faster too. Yeah, hopefully you have enough space here. It's only because these are rails; they unload in three. If it was like something or uh, beams, if they were like like the rails and there was ten, right? Then it, it, there's no you way. You need a lot of keep... space to unload. Yeah. So. We do this all the time. Rolling unloads, is that a thing anywhere? Are there are there rolling unload places, or is it always, like, stop? It depends. Everything you uh, say is it depends. You know, I saw a photo, and I don't know how old this photo is, and maybe you know about it, but there's a photo of, like, I think it was in Idaho, where a corn hopper leaked, and it filled the middle of the track with corn for, like, a couple <laughs> miles. So, I've like, you just have picture. rail, bed of corn, and then rail, and that was, like, the whole... You're good. You can stop whenever, and then... Okay, and then run around. Run around. You have yeah, space still for so, more cars? How much space you got? Uh, I still got uh, maybe two, like another car length or two up here. And you got probably another three on the back, and then we'd have to split the train if, if that so was we could the do, case. We could do probably 16 cars then. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then if it's more than 16, we just have to split it and do it twice. And... All right, I'm going to come Good hop deal. on board as uh, for local. Well, I can, after I, I'll flick these switches first. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, so so that was my that was my Idaho adventure. But live unloading, like unloading without uh, stopping. They, they exist. Places like that exist, and you're usually thinking of stuff like ore uh, that drops out the bottom, and they're doing it like snail's pace. They're going like one mile an hour. But over I'm a sure grate. I'm sure there's other types too, uh, over a grate kind of thing. In the narrow gauge, I don't really think there was any instances of that just because of how manual everything was. So to unload, uh, so you would literally like unload, inch a car forward, unload, inch a car, unload. Like that's... That would yeah. Be, so you'd have to keep in a locomotive like fired for ever. Oh, hold up a sec. Let me... Yep, 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 yep. I see. So you'd, you'd literally yeah, have to have the fireman and the engineer then just sitting in the locomotive, like keeping the fire just going enough to just like... Keep your idling, yep. basically. Switch and, switch and fire, basically. You know, and that, that's if it needs to be that way. Sometimes industries were set up so it was like, okay, they've got a long unloading track where you spot 15 cars, and then the dudes with the shovels can go, oh my god, what is this con? Well, the, I ran out of space. There's no stopper, so don't don't bonk <laughs> too hard. So you're just you're just driving off the edge if you do. It's okay. I mean, it works. Wait, I figured you could just like turn off your reg and then coast. You know, let your train go up on its own and then coast back down. I mean, it, it works. It works. That's that's. What, oh, there's what a tree. There's that. a oh, tree. That's fine. That's fine. There's a tree. Hi, hi, tree. You didn't even try to slow down. I I heard nope. your reg still going. There was nope. no attempt. I I did not mentally process the fact that I was going to hit the tree until I had already hit it. I so. don't. I I don't think that one would hold up in the uh, Asha. What is it? The Asha. Union meeting or whatever afterwards. It's uh, it's fine. It's fine. I don't Sir, know I did not that. see the tree. I thought the tree would move for me. So I, I thought the tree was gonna get out of the way. Yeah, I mean, I'm a train. I'm scary. Trees should know that. Oh god. Okay, hold on. Okay, man. you you put the pin in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna just gonna do this. Perfect. There you go. Problem solved. Got it. There we are. 
All right, so tenders, so tender drawbar, right? Is that what's called drawbar? Draw. Yes, draw the drawbar. Right. So they're like, it's a, it's basically like a big steel bar with a hole on either side, and it's like, yep. and it's got the hole is pinned to the tender to rotate. Does it have any tilt to it or just rotation? It's a straight pin. Yep, just rotation. So I mean, you can get a little bit of up and down, just from the uh, axially, of the pin. but yeah. Okay, and then it's a fixed length all the time, so that's pretty much it. Yes. Like your tender never yeah. shifts from. Other I mean, than a little bit with the spring. There's I guess. a bit of a slot to the the pin setup, so that there is a little bit of motion. Right. But it's it's not it's not much. And then they use an overlapping plate like this. Like, what's the chances of you getting your foot caught between the tender and the locomotive? For Very example? high if you don't know what you're doing. Oh, really um, high? Oh, perfect. Yeah, oh, that's good. So we we always tell folks who come cab ride with us, like, keep both of your feet on the apron, which is what the plate that is on the engine but rides on the tender is called. Right. Because on 491, she's so big and so long that when you're going around the corner. Um, you'll get maybe an inch or two between the tender tank and the edge of the apron. Oh, interesting. But on the straight, there's like a foot or a foot and a half. Right. So it uh, it gets to be a bit much. So you, you definitely have to keep your eyes on it and keep that in mind because it, it, it can be a severe pinch point. So when you're shoveling coal, though, as the tender's moving around a corner, you're standing on the locomotive side. You're and, entirely on the locomotive side. And you're just uh, reaching most over the tender side and like yeah. shoveling the coal out. How do you Unless, get the coal yeah. from the back of the tender to the front of the tender? With the shovel. <laughs> so you, well, the, you'll eventually the immortal, have to walk like, further into the tender. Yes, in, in the immortal words of one of my favorite volunteers, Colonel Frank Stapleton, why do I have to shovel all of my coal twice? <laughs> right, and it's because you got to go. You got to basically shovel it from the back. To you got to go up, and yeah, some tenders have. And then slow what? Cheats. You hit a hill, and all the coal slides to the back, and you're like, son of a. I mean. It, we don't hit hills steep enough with trains to make that really a problem, but I mean, that could be a thing. Uh, some tenders do have slope sheets that are designed to have gravity help carry the coal forward. Right. Particularly bigger tenders do that, but a lot of the small tenders don't because that means you're messing with your water capacity and water is more important than fuel. So, you know, wouldn't some you just, why wouldn't you just make a sloped water tank then, like a sloped water tank underneath and have the... Well, because if you're having the, the like, tall water legs being at your maximum storage capacity of water like this tender has adding a slope means you're removing water space because you can't make the tender higher because of visibility and other concerns so no, but you put you put a slope like underneath the fuel oh i see what you, i mean i guess yeah. if, you're, if you're reducing i was saying you put it under the fuel more and, and fill that space like kind of like an f1 car has the fuel tank under the driver's seat yeah and and the bigger tenders that can afford to do that do and it makes sense because then you get a better balance and you also get the fuel to, to pour We're more. shaking but violently, the small, sir. Yeah, uh, small and stone. Like, we are running really fast, aren't we? Yeah. And actually, you can just leave this train hooked up because we're probably going to use these same cars next episode to go do some coal mine stuff. Probably right. So I guess we can just pull into the runaround and, and be yeah, there. Yeah, just pull into the so. runaround and leave it there. We don't need a hump just yet. Oh, but anyway, the there's the uh, ironworks hooked up. So perfect. Got to supply with some coal and some lumber. We could do a big lumber run, actually, which would be relatively quick. And, okay. Uh, you got got lots of like options for next time. Yeah, I'm, I'm bummed, Con, that we're that we're out of time though, because you talked about all the corn in the tracks, and I wanted to tell tell the story about the drunk grizzly bears that got hit by trains in Montana. Anyway, okay, maybe next well, time. next time we'll talk about drunk grizzly bears. Remember that for next time. That's the starting <laughs> topic for next, next episode. Yes. Is uh, the, the drunk, drunk grizzly, grizzly bears. bears. Yeah, I saw this yeah. picture online. It was just a meme, and it was like it was literally like a corn hopper in Idaho or something like that had lost it's uh like one of the one of the gates i guess broke like the sluice gates or whatever right and it just it literally just filled the track like you have two rails and you have a space between the two rails and it was full and of it's corn just like all corn yeah. all those cow and all those cows and farm animals in that area would have been super happy you know <laughs> just like and the bears and Remember, the bears important yeah. <laughs> but anyway let us know what you guys think in the comments down below uh next week you know drunk grizzly bears so stay tuned for that and uh you know, let us know what you guys think of railroads. We're uh, almost done connecting up all the industries, which is exciting. And then I can, uh, and then we can work on getting all the extra engines, more cars, and then having you know more people running more trains at the same time to really just start making the cash. So uh, yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comments down below. Like, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye.